Here at Rancho, they requested that we have a weekly get-together on Wednesdays, Wednesday evenings, and uh, they left it up to me to decide on a particular subject. Uh, and so I chose uh, the following title. Maybe you've seen the flyers. Uh, if you haven't, they're up, so you can check them out. Uh, we said this is going to be called Prophetic Stories, Illustrations of Life. Prophetic Stories, Illustrations of Life. And we're talking about a particular life here, which is the life of the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is a little short write-up I had come up with. Um, we will be discussing the most beloved human to the hearts of the believers, Muhammad, God's messenger and servant, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The intent behind this series will be to analyze selected events of the Prophet's life from new angles using special lenses. So we're not simply going to go through the history and the events from A to Z. Rather, we're going to select for every time we meet a particular event and kind of dissect it, learn about lessons that we can extract from it. This way, if you don't come every single time, whenever you come, you can find some benefit. But if the series is all intertwined, then if you didn't hear what happened yesterday or last week, you would be completely in the dark. We'll be drawing upon various historical reports to bring about some of the best true stories ever told. These stories will testify to the fact that God gave His chosen prophet the best manners and the most sublime character. Our reflections will aim to extract and apply lessons from these stories in hopes of elevating our personal conduct and in the process rectifying our own lives. Um, so that's the, the intent. This is kind of like our purpose and vision behind this, this class. Um, uh, there's brothers doing salah, and I don't typically like bothering people who are doing salah. Uh, so maybe we'll slow down a bit until they, they finish. Um, now there is another hall here in the masjid, right? A multi-purpose room? Okay. Do you folks prefer to be here? Or in that room for these Wednesday night classes. Here is okay. Here is okay. So the only issue with it being here in the musalla is this is the place where people perform salah, so we should not bother them. But then, if we decide that we're going to be here, then maybe we can request, in order for us not to bother people, if they can perform salah in the other hall. This way we're not interrupting them. And this is one of the traditions of the Prophet He said, even if you're in the masjid, you're reading Quran, don't read it too loud, because there's people performing salah. So this is a public space, it's not private. This is not like your own uh, mini spiritual space. Although you can make it as that, but you have to share the space with other people. So in light of that, just want to do some, some of those uh, thoughts together of what you guys prefer. The next thing is, what I like to do is typically go through a book. A book will help us uh, be on a particular script. Because if I go off script, we'll all get in trouble. Okay? Uh, so we stick to a script and then I'll mention commentary and we'll fill the time, inshallah, God willing. I also have another rule is that I like to say things all in English. And if I happen to mention anything in Arabic, I will translate it. But the medium of this class will be English. I'm not teaching Arabic here. I teach Arabic in the daytime in seminary at IOK. But right now, we're going to study something in English. And I don't need to test your Arabic skills. Um, but the book that I choose, because I typically read in Arabic, will be in Arabic. So I'll basically be doing the translation. Uh, the book that I chose is similar to the title of the series. It's called Qasas uh, al-Nabawiyya, which are basically prophetic stories. That's where we get the title from. Uh, but it's, it's something interesting. He says, Zawaya jadida li qasas al-Sira, which means new perspectives to the stories that are very common to us. A lot of us know these stories. We've heard them maybe starting at Sunday school when we were younger. We hear them seasonally. But now we're going to look at them from a different perspective. That's uh, hopefully the, the, the plan here. Um, so 
also one of the etiquettes. So now we'll start since the brothers are, are done. I apologize, brothers, for interrupting you uh, performing salah. Alhamdulillah, they can't hear me, so that's very good. It means I didn't bother them during salah. Um, so when we begin, we should always begin with the name of Allah. So we start Bismillah. And uh, what that means, I always try to have some type of learning in whatever we do. So Bismillah means we're beginning with the name of Allah using three things. We're asking Him for help as we begin. We're asking for His blessings. And we're asking for His protection. So whenever we say Bismillah, that's what it actually means. I begin asking God for help, for blessings, and for protection. Now, nobody tells you that in the translation, right? We got whack translations that say, in the name of God. And you're like, okay, in the name of God, what? Right? So this is the actual meaning. That's what the Arabic means. That ba is called ba'ul isti'ana, which is a letter that you use to seek help with. Right? Uh, and it's also called ba'ul ibtida, which is the letter that you begin with. And the name of Allah is a blessed name, so it's full of blessings. So I'm going to start with the intro of the author. Alhamdulillah, we praise Allah, God Almighty, the Lord of everything in existence. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah. We ask him to bless his messenger and honor him and compliment him, shower him with grace, protection, and blessings. Uh, since we are covering the life and the events of the messenger's life, it's good to increase in this particular prayer. As-salatu ala nabi Some of you call it durud. Some of you call it as-salawatu al-ibrahimiyyah. Again, the meaning behind that is we're asking Allah to honor his messenger, to bless his messenger and to shower him with protection and grace. So uh, we should do that out of appreciation. You know, we were all taught since we were young, when someone does something nice to you, what should you do? What do you do when someone does something nice? You thank the person. So this is proper etiquette. This is a universal etiquette. So whenever we start something, we want to thank Allah in the beginning for giving us the opportunity to start it. Hence why we say Alhamdulillah, it means thanks and praise are due to Allah. Then the next thing is, this information that we're covering typically comes to us by means of messengers of God. Right? So Islam comes to us through the messenger. So out of our appreciation for the messenger, it's also proper etiquette whenever we begin, after we praise Allah and thank Him, to bless the messenger and to honor Him. And, but we can't do that by ourselves. So what should we do? <coughs> the proper etiquette is when you cannot thank someone personally, you try to find someone who can thank them. Who can thank the Messenger ﷺ? No one can truly give him his due rights except for Allah. Hence, we ask Allah to thank him for us. And this is the meaning of the prayer. Then the next thing we do typically, if we're reading a book, then we make a prayer for the author because he is the medium by which we're covering this information. So we say, may Allah have mercy on the author or bless the author or so forth. Again, we're trying to learn something here, is to appreciate people. Uh, the hadith of the Prophet says, Man la nasa la Allah. Whoever is not grateful to people will not be truly grateful to God. Right? So this is something for us to incorporate into our lives. Always thank people whenever they do something nice. Whenever they have shared something with you, thank them. Try your best to repay them. So the author here says, he starts off with the greeting of Islam. He says, Salamun, Salamullahi alaykum wa rahmatuhu wa barakatuh. Again, this is something that we constantly hear. This is the greeting of Islam. Unfortunately, the translation that we have is very inaccurate. What it actually means is not peace be upon you. Sorry to disappoint you. It means God be with you. Because Salam is the name of Allah. It's as Salam. So as Salam is one of the names of Allah. So also this is something that we want to incorporate into this class. We want to get to know more about Allah. Right? So Allah in English means the one true God. That's the meaning of the word. As-salam means the one that's perfect and with no flaw. As-salimu min al-uyubi wa naqais So whenever we greet someone in Islam, we're actually giving them a prayer. We're saying, God, the perfect one, be with you. With what? To protect you. It's a prayer of protection. So wishing that Allah protects the listener, whoever we greet, whenever we meet one another, that's the first thing we should do as Muslims is give salam. And this is what it means. It means protection be with you. And the mercy of God and His grace and His blessings. Then he says a greeting from, from God be with you. And then he starts off speaking about our book, which is kind of like the intro that I gave earlier. 
So he says this is some of the best stories and this is a passage taken from the Quran. The story of Joseph starts نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصِ We are relaying to you, narrating to you the best of all stories. So the stories in Islam are the best of stories. Why are they the best of stories? Because they're truthful. Most stories are lies. The difference between the stories that we have to offer, whether Quran and Sunnah, is that they're truth. Not only are they truth, they lead you to the truth. So it's, it's a double positive there. So this is some of the best stories. But he says, we're not trying to look into it only from a historical perspective, just going through the events. Typically, when people learn the messenger's story, they, I, I know my, my daughter, she learned a little song about the Prophet. So basically, it incorporates the seerah. So this is the type of Sunday school education we kind of have. It says, Muhammad is our Prophet. Now, the, the song is in Arabic. Uh, um, Muhammad is our Prophet. His father is Abdullah. His mom is, you guys know all this. What's his mom's name? Amina, right? Um, uh, Abdullah, is his, uh, Abdullah is his father, Amina is his mother, uh, Abu, Abu, Abdul Muttalib is his grandfather. Um, his father died before he met him. Um, then Abu Talib took care of him. His wife is Khadija. Uh, and then they speak about the nurse of the Prophet, uh, which is who? Halima. And then she says, he lived in Mecca and he died in Medina. End of story, right? So this is kind of like the, the jeopardy of things, is that we just get some information, but we don't really know the rest of the story. It's like everyone knows these things, and you keep on hearing them every single Sunday for a lifetime, and then you really don't know anything about the Messenger Muhammad. Just imagine if your dad says, you know, I want to tell you about my grandfather. He's telling you about his family history, and then he says, yeah, his name is this, his mom's name is this, his grandfather's name is this. His father died when he was a baby, so he's an orphan. And then he lived in this city, he died in a city, end of story. You're like, Daddy, can you please tell me some more about our life story? But that's all we have. How would you feel? You would feel like you have no clue who you're talking about. So this is the most important man, right? Unfortunately, most of the information that we have about him is this trivial stuff, right? Those small things that don't really bring us closer to God or closer to the messenger. And this is where it's very, very um, sad. Because we want to try to incorporate something into our lives. Whatever we learn, we should try to incorporate it into our lives. So he says, I'm not simply going to narrate the stories, but what I'm going to do is give you selected events from his life. Uh, and the point behind that is he has combined all the narrations related to a particular event. So this is another thing that's important in Islam. In Islam, we should never take things out of context. Taking things out of context is like the following ayah. We have an ayah in the Quran that says, فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ Damned are the ones who do salah. That's a full ayah. You're like, you're saying this in the masjid? Blasphemy! Hussam, don't ever invite him again. This guy is saying whoever comes to the masjid will be cursed. That's when you take things out of context. What does Allah say right after that? He explains who these people are. الَّذِينَ هُمْ يُرَاءُونَ وَيَمْنَعُونَ الْمَعُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِ عَن صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ they're the ones who actually don't perform their salah on time. They, they delay it, they miss it, they, they're negligent of it. And then they're the ones that show off when they do perform worship. And then they don't even help people in the simplest of matters. That's who Allah is talking about not being. But if we take things out of perspective, out of context, that's what we come up with, a twisted understanding. Same thing happens whenever we have narrations from the sunnah. So sometimes people tell you, the hadith says, okay, I respect the hadith, I love the hadith. I want to implement the hadith, but the hadith says other things about this subject too. So one thing we need to learn is, whenever we have a teaching, we should try to do cross-referencing. Get everything related to it in Islam. So whenever we speak about, we just mentioned, for example, the name of Allah. Somebody can say, Allah is Allah, that's it. You're like, brother, there's other names of Allah. He's like, no, his name is Allah. What happened there? It's, it's a misrepresentation. Allah says about himself, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Right? So this person takes this and runs with it. But Allah has more than that as descriptions, as attributes. So we need to look throughout the Qur'an and the prophetic tradition to gain that. He says, these stories, what I've done is try to get all the narrations related to a particular event. And then basically it fills all the pieces of the puzzle. 
And then the picture that comes, the image that comes, the illustration, remember we said life illustrations, the illust or illustrations of life, the illustration that comes is a complete picture of that particular event. And then it brings about great beauty. What's the beauty that it's referring to? It is a witness that God Almighty has created His Prophet in the best of manners. Now we all say this, we say He's the best, but how is He the best if we don't know how He's the best, right? So He was the most beautiful of people in appearance, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? A lot of people know that Yusuf, Joseph is beautiful, right? He was given half of all beauty. What about the Prophet Muhammad? He's even more beautiful than that, right? But he didn't say, I'm more beautiful. But if you study and dissect the narrations, you learn that he's the most beautiful in the way he was created, in his form. Likewise, he was the best of all people in his conduct and character. Hence, Allah says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ You have the best of all manners, of all ethics. And then he says, you're going to see all these beautiful things that complete his personality. So that's another important factor. That a lot of us may be great outside of our homes. In a professional setting, we're good. We treat people nicely, we're kind, we smile, we open the door, we allow the elderly to sit, right? But then people see us behind closed doors. Those are our family members, our wives, our children, our husbands, our parents, right? They see us behind closed doors. We're no longer professional in the house, right? So what's interesting with the Prophet's life is every single detail of his life is recorded. Not only is it recorded, it was commanded to be shared. Even the most intimate of his life details. So some of the scholars, they say, we know more about the Messenger Muhammad than we know about our own father's private life. Because like, you don't even dare step into your father's bedroom, right? In a lot of cultures, you don't go there. One time, we were helping a brother move or something, bringing some things into his house. And by accident, his like, bedroom door was open. And it was like, oh my God. You know, the, like the World War III or something. He was so offended. I said, take it easy, what happened? He said, no, nobody can see my bedroom. I'm like, okay, I'm not like, there's no one in it. He's like, exactly. But again, culturally, there are so many of these things. And then we're going to learn in Islam, there's nothing really wrong with that. So a lot of things that we have in culture contradict the story of the Prophet. His bedroom was an open book. The most intimate of details. What happens when it's dark? under the blanket, when he's even bathing, everything is recorded, right? With all of that, we notice a complete personality. And this is what we all should strive for. That maybe I'm good in this aspect in life, but I need to improve in other aspects in life. Who's the model? Who's the example? This beautiful man that we are talking about. He also had a balance in the different roles he played. That's something very important. So a lot of us, again, we may be great business people, but we're terrible husbands. We may be great community organizers, terrible wives, right? What was key about the Prophet? Perfection in every single role he played. Perfect husband, perfect father. Perfect teacher, perfect leader. Perfect general, perfect judge. What happens, right? The point is, again, he's the model that we're supposed to emulate. Another thing about his life is very spontaneous. It wasn't rigid. A lot of people think, well, the Prophet of God, because he was so busy, like there was no room for fun. No, a lot of things were actually spontaneous. So much so, we're going to learn about stories. A woman would be having an issue, a personal issue, psychological issue, a mental issue. She would stop him in the street and she's like, I need to talk to you. He didn't say, talk to my manager or book an appointment. And this is what we say. Of course, we say this because of life is different, no doubt. But his model was different. And this is why you can't expect the same thing like the Prophet was because he is special but this is what we shoot for we should try to go for that we're not gonna live up to the model perfectly but don't say well you know he's a messenger of God right so he takes he goes with her she tells him all her complaints until she's completely satisfied then she's like I'm afraid if I get back home she was a servant she was a domestic worker she's like I'm afraid if I go back home and I'm late my parents are going my, my family is going to punish me he's like okay I'll take you back Right? So he brings her back. And, and the people are surprised what happened there, right? And he says, she was worried that you guys are going to be upset with her. They're like, you know, because you brought her, we're going to actually help her out. And at that time, there was slavery. And they freed her in that event. They said, we free this particular woman, right? Because she came with the Prophet of God. 
So the idea is spontaneous in life, being very simple, yet being so great. Again, that's very difficult. Some people, if they're rich, they can't get off of that garb. Like they, they have to maintain a particular type of uh, standard in their life. But the Prophet wasallam, he didn't care about that. He would sit down. One time a man came and he was terrified of him. He, would, he wouldn't even be able to sit down. He's like, what happened? Why are you scared? He, he says, he couldn't even talk. He's like, I'm just a man. I'm a human being. I'm a servant and I'm the, the, the son of a servant. I eat meat just like everybody else. He, he's described it. He's like basically jerky. He says, I eat jerky. Akulul qadid. Qadid is dried meat, so like jerky. He's like, I eat what you eat. Like, don't be terrified, right? So being simple, although he's so great. Being perfect, although he was so real. Again, because some people are idealistic, and that's beyond reality. So he was perfect within the realm of reality. He was very far away from going out of his way unnecessarily. Something called takalluf. And takalluf is basically when you fake things. He was very natural, right? When he treated people, he was genuine with them. He was authentic, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So then the, the author says something interesting. He said, this is not between a writer and a reader. I don't want you to look at this information as that type of relationship, as a speaker and a listener. He says, both of us are looking at this beautiful image. We're all looking at these illustrations of the prophetic life, the prophetic stories. What we're trying to get out of it is how does it affect our daily lives? And then we can also look at the, the beautiful things that he was able to achieve in that particular short period of time while having, so all the achievements that he had, again, you hear a lot of people, I don't know if you guys heard some of the interviews of Steve Jobs, right? Great achievements, but personally he was suffering, he was struggling, and he died with, with, with a terminal illness, right? So he's very weak. So here we look at the Prophet, it says, he has these great achievements, but then he's got this tranquil personality. He had complete tranquility. He also had a joyful life. Although it wasn't easy, it was full of struggles, it was difficult, there was, there was pain in it, but he was quiet about it. And then he also had beautiful emotions in it. He was very truthful in his authentic feelings, and there was a lot of joy and pleasure therein as well. So he says, I want you to focus in and zoom in. So this is something I want to mention here, is that we're going to hear something here. I want you to reflect over these things. Don't just rely on me to get reflections. You know, some of our teachers, we would read books with them, and they would just read like a paragraph. And then we'd be sitting in a circle, and they're like, okay, what does this paragraph tell you? I'm like, you're the teacher, right? It's like, no, no, I want to know what it says to you, what it speaks to you. So personal reflections, because Maybe you'll get something that somebody else doesn't get. Of course, one time I cheated. So what I did, we were studying the Prophet's Sirah. It wasn't really cheating, but I told the Shaykh, I said, I want to go last, right? And then everybody's mentioning their reflections. And then it comes back to me and I got like a whole book of information in my mind. Because whenever someone says something, it actually triggers an idea in your mind. So always remember that. The scholars also say when you have ideas, write them down. You know, you got thousands of ideas every day that just go to waste. Some people make money off of their ideas. A lot of people just waste the things that they have. So take notes, right? Alhamdulillah, hopefully we're gonna have this recorded. Um, and, uh, but if you can take your own personal notes, that will be positive as well, just for your own. I'm not gonna test you on this information. He says, you're gonna see different perspectives from the same text that he's reading and he's reflecting on. And then he says, it's gonna make you stop in a way that it didn't make anybody else stop. It's gonna make you pause and think. And he says, that's nothing surprising because the Prophet's biography, his life story, what is called Sirah, which is basically his lifestyle, the way he walked his life. Walking the walk of life, that's where Sirah comes from. In Arabic, Sayr means to walk. So Sirah is the way you walk your life. But they translated his biography. Again, another bad translation. He says, it's a deep ocean of information. And everybody from an ocean or a river, actually, he says a river because ocean, you're going to be like, why am I going to go take a sip from an ocean? It's salty. So crystal clear spring water. He says, and everybody will take a scoop, their own scoop from it, depending on the vessel that they have, right? You may have a big cup. He has a smaller cup. Somebody else has like a little, very tiny cup. Somebody has a huge bucket. Everybody's going to get their own share of that river. And then he says, 
I want you to look at these images and these illustrations with your heart. So this is what we're going to start with. It has to be based on love. This whole thing, our relationship with this man, we have to love him. Part of loving him though, you can't love someone if you don't know about him. So that's what we're trying to achieve, right? But he's saying, look at it with a view of love. Now I know it's not very popular to say, you know, just kind of look at it with love because people want to encourage you to be critical thinkers, right? Critical thinking, and you want to challenge the thing and challenge the text. This is not the time for that. Academically, in academic settings, I think it would be good. But here, try to look, he says, with your heart, with your love, and with your faith. You're looking at these different images and these illustrations of the prophetic life, and you're going to see certain things that are going to make you pronounce and testify. And then he mentions a verse from the Quran. It says, Allahu a'lamu haythu yaj'alu risalata. This is a very good principle to memorize and to learn in Islam. That God knows best where He places His message. Where He places His message. It was said to the Prophet in his lifetime, why were you chosen? You're not popular. You're not rich. You're not famous. Why, don't they, why didn't he choose one of the, the, the men, the great men of the two cities? The two cities are Mecca and Ta'if. So Allah revealed this as a response. God knows best where He will place His message. This is the same thing that, this is the same answer for us to find out how come there is spaces that are more beloved to God than other spaces, the masajid. They're more beloved to Allah than any other space in life. Why? Because Allah knows best. He chooses. Your Lord, He creates whatever He wishes and He selects, He makes selections. The messengers are called al-mustafayn al-akhyar, the selected best. The best people who are selected from humanity. And that's why Allah says, Allahu yastafi min al malaikati rusulan wa min nas. It is God who chooses and selects from angels specific ones for different tasks. And also He chooses and selects from humans messengers. Right? So when people ask, so why was He the messenger? Who chose Him? God chose Him. That's it. That's the response. Now a believer will say, you know what, if God chose him, no problem. But a lot of people who challenge this, they have a problem with God to begin with. That's the issue. So again, we're going to have to go and fix that issue too. How do you fix that? By getting to know about God. So it has to be knowledge. Allah says to us, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Know for certain that there is nothing worthy of worship besides God. So the first thing we should start with, and this is the objective again behind learning, even though we're going to try to make it entertaining, we're going to laugh, we're going to joke, we're going to interact. But the point is learning, education. And this is one of the primary focuses of the prophet life, prophet's life. He says, I was sent as a teacher, right? Now he was a beautiful teacher though. He wasn't a condescending teacher. He wasn't an abusive teacher. He was a loving teacher, sallallahu alayhi wa So then he says, what I want us to do is to have this communal reflection in these illustrations. And we want to reflect over them so we can get some beautiful meanings extracted. And then it can affect and influence us in our lives. And he says, there are so many different things to look at. So he says, I'm actually looking forward to your reflections. So hopefully, maybe some of you can share reflections. What we're gonna have, I think uh, the, the Masjid, on their Facebook page, they may post the flyer. Uh, and also we have it on the, uh, the IOK Institute of Knowledge, uh, their, their Facebook page. And I think they have a Facebook page with, with, with me on it too. Uh, so share some of the reflections if you have any. The video, whenever it's there, there is comments. Share them there and share them with me. Tell me something that I didn't share. And then he says in the end to conclude, and we'll take a little break here. Uh, he says, I ask Allah to bless us all, to allow us to earn the love of his prophet and messenger. And the point behind that is to win the promise that the messenger made on the day of resurrection. He says, المرؤ مع من أحب The individual will be resurrected with those he loves or she loves. So we want to be with him. If we want to be with him, then we want to ask Allah to gain that love so we can be truly with him. You know, the companions, they said, uh, one time a guy came from outside. Again, maybe we'll read this later on, but just very briefly, a guy came from outside of the city and he says, oh, messenger of God, I haven't prepared much good deeds. You know, I do the basics. I do the minimum, right? But I haven't done other things. But he says, but I swear I love you and I love God. 
And this is where this particular statement came. It says, the person will be with the ones that he loves. The Sahaba, the disciples of the Prophet, the companions, they said, that day was the happiest day of our lives because the Sahaba were very polite. Because they were around the Messenger, they didn't actually bother him all the time with questions. Although he was available for them. But they're like, you know what? We didn't really like to ask him unnecessary questions. So we used to love it when strangers would come out from out of town, you know, a visiting person to the community, and he would ask these questions. Because it's awkward when you see everybody every single day, right? And then they're like, man, this guy is asking questions every single day. Can you like get off of my back? But when somebody comes from outside the community, it, it's easier for them to ask. Because like they're never coming back and you're never going to see them again. So you kind of give them like a break. You don't really uh, worry about them. So the companions, they said that was the happiest day of our lives because they said, we love the messenger. And this is a prophecy that you will be with those that you love. Okay, so um, we're going to start now with the, first, with the first lesson. And the title of the first lesson is uh, A Night in a Cave. So basically, this is very interesting because it's going to skip the first 40 years of the Prophet's life. Although there's going to be some lessons from those 40 years within here. Um, and like we said, we're not going to go into every single detail. But this is a very interesting way of organizing the text. The way he organized it here is this is what really matters. The, the day where he became a prophet is what truly matters. Everything that happened before that was leading up to it, right? Um, so then this is going to give us a context to humanity and to the human condition at the time of the advent of the messenger Muhammad. So he says... The light of divine missions had been turned off. So you're living in a state of darkness. Allah described this place, this condition in the Quran. He says, Ala fatratin min rusul. There was a break. Fatra is a pause, is a break of sending messengers. That break lasted from the time of Jesus the Christ all the way to Muhammad. 600 years. There was no prophet between them two. So basically, by the time Muhammad comes on the scene, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the world was a very dark place. There was only a few people who were truly still following the teachings of Christ, and most other people were just ruined. So he says there were so many darknesses, something on darknesses, something to reflect on in the Quran. Allah describes darkness in the plural. He, de he describes light in the singular. Why is that? So basically, there are so many different ways for you to get into the darkness and the distractions. So many things pulling us, left, right, and center. But there's only one source of goodness, and that is Allah, right? So the light of Allah is singular. He says, people were drowned in the ignorance of oppression, all types of oppression, and also paganism and idolatry, which is basically the worship of things within the creation. He says, humanity reached a condition where they were deserving of God's maqt. Maqt is when someone really dislikes something, when someone hates something. Humanity deserved to be disliked by God. This is important, again, because you know a lot of times people, they say God loves you, God loves everyone. Those are not proper concepts. They're definitely not from Islam. There's other traditions that may say this. So you got to be careful. God does not love criminals, for example. Now, they have a chance to repent and to think, fi fix things up. And once they repent, God will be happy and will rejoice to accept them. But when they're involved in criminal activity, He doesn't love. He tells us who He loves and who He doesn't love. Humanity reached a stage where God was not happy with them. So this is what the hadith says. It says, God looked at humanity, every single human, the people, he says, the occupants of earth, people who live on our planet. And he hated all of them, the Arabs and the non-Arabs. Every single one. Except for a few remnants of the people who were following the scriptures of the past. This is a prophetic narration. Now, he doesn't actually say it's a prophetic narration, but it is. So he tries to have it in a novel form. So this is all like an essay. He says, and in that human condition, there was a person who used to go out of his town and he would go across the canyons in the desert 
and he would be surrounded by mountains, but he had chosen a specific mountain to be in. Now, how many of you have gone to Mecca? Okay. A lot of you, when you go to Mecca, they take you on a tour of the different uh, places to see that have a significance in the life of the Prophet, right? There is a place called Jabal al Nur, and in it is a cave called Gharu Hira, right? If you haven't been there, just Google it and see how it looks. It, so he says this. He says, when you look at this mountain, so I want you all as a homework assignment, look at the appearance of this particular mountain, Jabal al-Nur. Look at its image. How does it look? He says, when you look at it, you think that God created it specifically for this man and for this particular event. Now, very interesting, by the way. This is the last time he goes up to that mountain. He used to go there for long periods of time in the few years leading up to him becoming a prophet. But he never went back up there again after this night. So tonight, we're talking about what? The night in the cave. This is the cave that we're talking about. He says, there are so many different mountains around it because the, 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 the way Mecca looks is full of these, uh, this, this harsh terrain and these mountains that are there. He says, but all the other mountains seem to be kind of like leaning down, except this one, it, it has a particular look. It's, it's up and it's proud and it's overlooking the rest of the city. He says, its summit is so high as if you were looking at something very far in the distance. And he says, going up to this mountain, to the top of it, is something very difficult. And the path to it is extremely, extremely rigid. He says, and this man was in this particular cave in the top of the mountain. If he was to sit down, he would see the horizon. And then he could also see from another <coughs> angle, the house of God, which was built by his father, Ibrahim. So again, a few things that we can extract right now quickly. The father of the Prophet Muhammad, biologically, immediately is named Abdullah. But he traces his ancestry back to Ibrahim. That's something very, very important. And you should have pride in that. Allah calls Ibrahim in our scripture in the Quran, Millata abikum Ibrahim. The way of life of your father Ibrahim. Now we're not all from his biological children. So he becomes, for some, a biological father. But then if they're not following his tradition, then he's not truly their father. Just like in the story of Noah, Noah asks Allah and he says, this is my son. He's on the mountain and you said you're going to save my family. Allah says, إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ مِنْ أَهْلِكِ He's not really from your family. إِنَّهُ عَمَلٌ غَيْرُ صَالِحِ He is actually a bad person. He behaves in a bad way. So being a biological child of someone does not actually make you chosen if that person was chosen. This is important. Especially with Ibrahim, because many people lay claim to Ibrahim, right? Abraham is someone that everybody calls a great patriarch, right? But the reality is, Allah responds and He says, Abraham, for example, was not a Jew nor a Christian. Why is that? It's historically impossible, because there were no such faiths at that time. He cannot have been that. You can't be something before it even comes into existence. What was his faith? Hanif and Muslima. Hanif, do you guys know what the word Hanif means? We hear this all the time. Some of you call yourselves Hanif. I know some Muslims, they're named Hanif. What's a Hanif? No. Walking straight, yeah. Okay, so that's, that's close. So they say Al Hanif is Al Ma'ilu an Shirk. It's the person who turns away from all distractions and from all false gods and dedicates himself to the one true God. So Allah says Abraham was that person. He did not worship anything in the creation. He focused on God and then he explicitly mentioned it and he was a Muslim, one who submits to God. Again, this house was built by his great ancestor Ibrahim. Alayhi salam. God's protection be with him. Abraham, you guys know the story of the Kaaba? That's a very important story. Why is the story of the Kaaba important? What do we know about the Kaaba? Tell me, what do you know? You're Yasin, right? Tell me about the Kaaba. 
Okay. But let's say we're not there. We're here. We're in Rancho right now. Why is the Kaaba important to us? Which one? Ibrahim built it. Okay. And it was actually rebuilt by him. But something else related to us, directly influencing us. In fact, right here, we're, we're affected by it. Yes. It's the Qibla. It's our direction to do Salah. You know, a lot of people have a problem with this. They're like, why well, you got to face a certain direction? You can't worship God. You know, God. Some people say everywhere, right? Yes, you can worship God everywhere. But God himself tells you to set yourself in a particular direction, specifically when you do formal worship. Not whenever you pray. We don't always have to look at the Qibla whenever we're praying. It's a good etiquette. But specifically in salah, in formal devotion, we're facing the Kaaba. So it's good for us to be connected to it, to know something about it, to know about its history. So again, he says, when he was up there at the cave, he says, it's as if he was in this high station, looking above everything that's below him, and a lot of the filth that he was seeing, idolatry, false worship, bad immoral behavior, no ethics. Now, of course, a lot of people... They think, you know, the situation was completely bad and evil. Throughout humanity, it was bad. But you know what? The worst of the bad, uh, uh, the best of the bad were the people the Prophet was sent amongst. Because a lot of people think, you know, no, no, they were bad people. They had a lot of bad attributes, but they also had a lot of good attributes, and that's why God selected them. And He selected the Prophet from among them. So there was a lot of darknesses. But then He looks up in the creation. And He looks back at some of the remnants of the messengers that came before. Now, you know what did he used to do in the cave? So this is also another thing, a, a reason to reflect a bit. What would he do in the cave? Quickly, I need a quick answer. No, before. We haven't gotten there yet. He was going up there regularly before he became a prophet. That's what we're going to learn next week. You said meditate. That's the famous one. They say meditation. It's not really meditation. That's, again, a mistranslation. This, the hadith says, <coughs> this is actually like one of the first narrations that you have in many of the books of Islam, which is called Hadithu Bad il Wahi. How did revelation begin? And I think that's why the chapter here begins with that particular event. How did revelation to the Prophet begin? He says, Kana yatahannathu fihi layaliya. He used to go up there and do tahannuth. Tahannuth is to be devoted in worship. You're like, but how would he worship? Remember who his people are? His people believed they were the children of Abraham. They had remnants of the religion of Abraham. They had the Kaaba. They had the Hajj. And they used to perform certain acts of worship as their forefather did. Even though they had adulterated it and changed it and altered it. But they still had some good things in them. So the Prophet worshipped God the best way he knew how to worship God. It was not meditation. I'll tell you why we have to be careful with the word meditation. Although that's very popular. It's because that's from different religions. So again, just be careful. Don't think you can just drop a word and say the Prophet was meditating. Because if you say he's meditating, some people can say, so is he like following Eastern religions, Eastern philosophies? Like, right now it's popular because like a lot of people are hippie and they... they so, was he like doing Hinduism, Buddhism? Because those are ancient religions. Is that what he was doing? No, he was worshiping God and reflecting over the creation of God. So it was twofold. How was he worshiping God? Whatever way his people knew how to worship God. Because there were people amongst his society that were still called Hunafa. That was their attribute. They were called those who reject false gods. They're dedicated to, to God himself. Okay, so... Then he says, this is a very good location, this particular cave, to reflect over the creation of the heavens and the earth, and also to direct yourself to God without any distractions after this particular reflection. So we're told in Islam to do two types of study of God's signs. We're told Allah's signs are twofold. Allah spreads signs in the creation. These are called ayatullahi al-mabthutha. Allah's signs within the creation. So there are signs all around us. We just have to open our eyes, right? Then look and don't be distracted by other things. And then ayatullahi al-matluwa, the signs of God that are recited or al-mastura that are documented, which is scripture. 
So the Prophet did not have scripture yet. So what was he looking at? The signs of God in the creation. And this is a, an important reflection here. You know, when he would wake up at night, um, he would actually look up and look at the stars, and then he would recite certain passages from the Quran. So the reference, I'm going to give you the reference. Ali Imran, chapter 3, verse 191. Basically, 191 till the end. Those references, he would look up and he would say, Woe to the person who looks at the creation and does not reflect over it. And we see this all the time. We're just distracted. And then he would recite the verses. Surely in the creation of the heavens and the earth and the alteration of night and day are signs for people who have intellect. Those who remember God standing, sitting, and laying on their sides. And they reflect over the creation of the heavens and the earth. Our Lord and Master, you have not created all this in vain. Protect us from the hellfire. Protect us from the punishment of the fire. So one of those nights, it was a clear night, and everything was silent, and he was in his reflection, and he was in his worship, and he was within this cave all by himself. And by the way, the cave is something very, very small. It's not like a place where it was a roomy space. It was very small. And all of a sudden, his quiet space is disrupted. And it was disrupted by the coming of an angel, and that angel is the angel of revelation. His name is Jibreel, and he came to him with a message from his Lord. So I want you, or all of us, to just reflect. You're in a quiet place, a dark place. It took you a long time to climb up there. No one is around you. You purposely left the distractions, and all of a sudden you're feeling disruption. You're hearing disruption and you're feeling it physically. He says, there is no one around you that you would expect to be up there with you. And all of a sudden you have this mighty angel coming and the prophet was not expecting him. You know when you're expecting someone, you're kind of like, you're waiting for an appointment. It's like, when is it going to come? Right now, for example, you're waiting for this class to end. Like, when is Isha coming, right? You're waiting on an appointment with Isha. 8.15, 8.15, right? He wasn't waiting for anything. He was not expecting anything. He wasn't anticipating anything, right? That's something very important. He wasn't waiting to be a messenger. He wasn't waiting for leadership. He wasn't waiting for revelation. He wasn't waiting for a book, for a scripture, for inspiration. And Allah speaks about this. This is all documented in the Quran. Tangent. The very first source that we should go back to when we want to learn about the Prophet is the Prophet's life. You know, this, this is what happened in my first year. Uh, we had Sila class. So the professor comes in and he's like, okay guys, I want you all to participate in this activity. What are the main references to study the Sila of the Prophet wasallam? And all these guys, you know, Islamic studies students, they're mentioning all these big book names, you know. The seerah of this guy and the seerah of that guy, Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham and Ibn Kathir and this and that. Because there is so much that's written on this. And he said, you guys are all wrong. And we're like, okay, this is, this is 101. You learn how ignorant you are. He says, the very first source of the seerah of the Prophet is the Quran itself. The Quran documents this whole life story within its one single volume that was revealed over a period of 23 years. So right now, I just gave you guys like a secret, right? So you're better off than all these Islamic studies students. So you can actually feel, feel proud. Uh, but that was something very powerful. You know, when the teacher shared that with us, we never reflected over that, but we kind of know it. We're like, yeah, the events are mentioned there. Here, as I'm talking, I'm mentioning things from the Quran, right? And throughout the stories, we're going to see that. So before even he's born, you guys are familiar with a chapter called Surah Al-Fil, right? Al-Fil, the elephant, right? What does that represent in the life of the Prophet? The year of his birth. He was born on the year of the elephant, right? So his birth is documented there, not explicitly. So again, you have to read in between the lines. His people, are they mentioned by name? We have the next chapter. What is it called? Quraysh. 
It's like, why would you have Quraysh here? Because it's telling you that this revelation is connected with this man. You can't understand the Qur'an without understanding the Prophet's life and you can't get to the Prophet's life except through the Qur'an. It's intertwined. Right? All of it is there, but we have to look for it. And don't, don't look at it as like some random thing. Oh, it's just mentioned there for no reason. Allah did not put it there in the final revelation that He's going to send to humanity by accident. Every single letter there is there for a reason. And that's what the scholars do. That's why you have volumes of books that reflect over the Qur'an. Right? So here he says, this is a very powerful message. And if the Prophet was trying to hide something, he would hide some of these things. Because if he was self-serving. It says, مَا كُنْتَ تَرْجُوا أَنْ يُلْقَى إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ You did not have this wish. You know, some people have a bucket list of things they desire to do. There was not even in his wildest dreams that he was expecting a book of revelation to come. مَا كُنْتَ تَرْجُوا أَنْ يُلْقَى إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ You did not have this wish and desire and hope for a book to, be co to come down onto you. إِلَّا رَحْمَةً مِنْ رَبِّكَ It was completely out of the grace of your Lord. This is also a powerful lesson, principle in Islam. It's all by the grace of Allah. Everything is by Allah's grace. This is a good conversation starter, by the way. We don't go to... Because, you know, some people who attack Islam... They say, you know, these Muslims, all they worry about is, you know, how many good deeds they have. And they're all waiting on, you know, the scale. They're going to be weighed. The more good deeds you have, the, the, the more chances you have to make it. That's not the belief in Islam. I don't know where they get it from. By the way, all these people are attacking Islam. So you can rest assured that they're not really being genuine. Either they're ignorant or they have other agendas. The Prophet says, none of you will enter paradise by your actions. Doesn't matter how many actions you got. You're not going to enter paradise through these actions. Yes, they are good signs and good indicators. They said, not even you, O Messenger of God. He says, not even me. Except if God showers me with His grace. Same thing that Allah says here. The revelation of this Qur'an did not come to you because you had it on your wish list. You had it on your bucket list. It came to you, why? إِلَّا رَحْمَةً مِنْ رَبِّكَ Complete grace compassion and mercy from your Lord. That's it. When you're chosen for something, there is no, it's like, oh my God, you know, why am I getting this? Mercy of Allah. When you get rizq, it's the mercy of Allah. You get a child. What, why me? It's like, how come people don't say why me when they get something good? It's only when something bad happens, right? They say, oh my God, why me getting sick? That's part of Allah's mercy too. Sickness is part of Allah's mercy. You know, some people will get sick to elevate them in stations, in rank. Because their deeds are not that good. But Allah wants them to have a high station. How are they going to get there? By tests. By difficulties. Right? This is also related to, to something very popular now. When people say, you know, don't judge me. You heard that one? Don't judge me? Okay. When, does people, when do people usually say don't judge me? In their minds, maybe they're not doing something wrong. But... Usually people are self-conscious, and when they slip, they feel that people are being judgmental against them. Have you ever considered that when you think so highly of someone, you're also judging them or you're not judging them? Like, you come to someone, you're like, oh, mashallah, brother, I always see you in the masjid, you must be really religious. Does anyone tell you there, don't judge me? Oh, sister, you look so beautiful. Does anyone say, don't judge me? But you say, you're ugly, what? So judgmental, right? Why is that? It's both judgment. Both of them are judgment. I'm trying to make a point here. Tests are good things and bad things that happen to us in life. fitna, Allah says. We test you with evil and with good as a test. So most people don't think that when they get money, they're being tested by Allah. And Allah responds to this in the Quran clearly. He says, فَأَمَّا الْإِنسَانُ إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ رَبُّهُ فَأَكْرَمَهُ وَنَعَمَهُ فَيَقُولُ رَبِّ أَكْرَمًا the human being, when God tests him, and he provides for him, and he enriches him, he says, my Lord is providing for me, is honoring me. But he uses the word ibtalahu. He's testing him with that. As when he tests him, and he constricts his earnings and his provisions onto him. He says, my Lord is humiliating me. Why me? But most people only say why me with the second, right? And everyone says, 
well, you know, if I'm doing something bad, I wouldn't be this well off. That's the arrogance that some of us have, right? Some people who are well off, they're like, well, if I'm so sinful, why would God be providing for me? I must be doing something good. فَيَقُولُ رَبِّ أَكْرَمًا That's the idea. How does Allah respond to both of these people? كَلَّا No way. Both of you guys are wrong. It's both a test. Good things are a test. Bad things are a test. Health is a test. Sickness is a test. You know, do you ever see somebody when you're healthy, like you're working out in the gym, and you're, you know, like you're breaking a sweat, your muscles are all big, somebody comes to you and they're like, you're just being tested right now. No one says that. When do people tell you you're tested? You're sick in the hospital, laying down in the hospital bed, and they come to you, they're like, I'm so sorry, you're just being tested right now. They're both tests. But we forget that when we're experiencing goodness, we're being tested. Richness and poverty, both are tests, right? So we ask Allah to allow us to pass the test. So the thing he says here is how scared would you be no matter how strong you are, how courageous you are if you were in that position right there? <laughs> you know, if I was in the masjid here, right, and I know the place very well and the lights are on, right, because the place is so big and then someone walks in and just screams, like I'll probably pee in my pants, right? I'm just going to talk about myself. I won't blame any of you. I won't judge you. I'm going to judge myself here, right? You're talking about you're all alone. It took you hours to climb up there. You've been there for a while, right? Reflecting. And all of a sudden you have this experience which is supernatural to say the least. Someone that's coming not just from outer space. Literally from outer space, right? This is not UFOs. You just got visited by an angel from outer space. A different species. A different kind a different, everything is different. Humans, we love to see other humans. And this is why people like to sit with people that are close to them because of our comfort level. The bubbles that we have are for protection. You know, social classes. So I was in Arabia studying and something really disturbed me because we had some of the locals studying with us. So the, the university is divided. We had, you know, uh, non-locals and then locals. With the locals, so everybody, we get roll call and everybody's name is being read. And they're all like from the same country, they speak the same language, but I notice they have different cliques. I'm like, man, this is not right. Something is going on. So I started looking into them and then I find out the ones from one tribe are together. The ones from the same family are together. The ones from the same background are together. Although if you look at them as an outsider, they all look the same. They're dressed the same because that country has a uniform basically, right? But you see them, and, but I asked, and some of them told me, they're like, look, because people are afraid of the unknown, right? And for us as Muslims, why do you guys sit here in the masjid? Like, why are you so comfortable sitting here on the floor? Try sitting on the floor out on the street. I thought about that the other day. I was driving, and I saw a homeless man sitting on the street. Yesterday, actually. This happened yesterday. But I was so tired, and I reflected. I said... This man must be really struggling. I, I wonder what would happen if I go and sit next to him. I didn't have the courage to do that, of course, right? And I was too tired and I found an excuse for myself. But just imagine, would you feel comfortable? Homeless people sit on the ground all the time. Have you ever gone and sat this comfortably with the homeless? No, why not? Because we're afraid. We're scared of the unknown, of the unfamiliar. So here you're talking about the Prophet ﷺ having this experience with unfamiliar, with an unfamiliar being. It was a surprise. The visit of the angel was a complete su surprise. But this is not where the surprise ends. So now, simply having another body there is terrible enough. Now you're getting a request. Like, you know, sometimes if I'm here and then somebody comes up, in the beginning I'll get scared. But then they're minding their business, I'm minding my, my business, right? But then they come and they want to talk to me. And this is now a second surprise. So he tells them, Iqra. Tells them, read. Now, definitely in his language. He's communicating with him. He understands what the guy said. Now, who is the angel talking to? A person who never wrote a document and never read a document. Allah documents this in the Quran. He says, وَمَا كُنْتَ تَتْلُو مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَلَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِكِ Before this event, you did not used to read any book before this book came, and you did not used to script it and write it with your right hand. And that's why he's known as the unlettered prophet. 
Again, we have to be careful in the word choice that we use. Some people translate it as illiterate. Illiterate has a connotation of being ignorant. So it's good for us to be polite with the Prophet and not to use illiterate, rather say unlettered, right? But it's a reality, it's a fact. And this doesn't take away anything from his status, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So that's why he answered with an answer that no one else can answer except for someone that has that experience. He says, مَا أَنَا بِقَارِئٍ I always wondered about this and what it means. It basically means I'm not someone who reads. It doesn't say I don't know how to read. Right? مَا أَنَا بِقَارِئٍ Basically, I am not one who reads. Qari is like Qadisab, right? You like that title or you like to be called doctor or something? Right? So Qari is one who recites. I don't know, that's another thing that we have in our community. We have all these titles, right? And uh, there is Qari, there is Hafid. Your actual name is Hafid, isn't it? No, you're a Sahib also. Right? <laughs> there is, so there's the other thing. You say Sahib for like out of respect. And, and it comes from like Sahib al Fadila, you know? So, um, so we, have, we have these things. It's, it's polite, it's nice to have that. But he tells him here, he doesn't say like, I'm not a, a, a reader. He's basically saying his qualities. He doesn't know how to read. And I'm not someone who normally reads. So then he gets now the third shock of that experience. He gets embraced by that body, by the angel. We know that story, right? But again, reflect over it from this perspective. How terrified must he have been? How physically challenging was it? Psychologically, you name it, this is like a complete traumatic experience. Yes. ما أنا بقارئ I am not one who reads. Well, first of all, he's telling them اقرأ. He's telling them read. Now, there is no document to read. But the next thing is he doesn't know how to read. So he's telling him who he is. He's introducing himself. I am not one who reads. Okay, I'm not one who reads. I'm not one who recites. So then he hugs him. He embraces him. And it was very, very tight until he couldn't handle it anymore. And the scholars, they extract a lesson out of this. They say, remember whenever you listen to the Qur'an and you call yourself a Muslim, how difficult it was for the messenger to receive revelation. It wasn't a walk in the park. Now this is just the beginning. Throughout the 23 years, whenever Qur'an would come to him, it would be a very difficult and challenging physical experience. Most people don't know that. He would break a sweat in the coldest of days. If you were sitting next to him and his body touches yours, your bones would almost break. One of the Sahaba was sitting next to him and they used to sit close to each other. And revelation came unto him in that moment and the guy's knee almost broke. He says, my thigh almost broke. It was a supernatural experience. He goes on, like we said, breaking a cold sweat. And he's in a different zone. He's in a different dimension, although he's with his community. So remember, the Quran did not come to us in an easy way. It was difficult on this man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He let him go, and then he asked him again, Iqra. Now, he's not asking him. This is not a request. This is a command. In the Arabic, it's called fi'lu amri. It's like if I tell you, stand up. I'm not, saying, I'm not making a request. Please stand up. He didn't tell him, please read. He says, read with force, with authority, with dominance. And again, he says, ma ana biqari. I'm not good at that. I don't do that. Now, by the way, qari, Muhammad, you asked a good question. Qari could also mean someone who reads just makes their own things up and reads them. So a qari would also be like someone who would use some type of prayers kind of to cure others. There is different meanings of that, of that word. But here he's just saying, I don't do that. Like, this is not my thing. He wasn't a poet. So he wasn't like someone who can just come up and start, what's, what's the word when you just freestyle? Improvise with speech like that. That didn't happen. Although he was very eloquent in speech. But he doesn't even know what's being asked and he doesn't have the capacity to implement the order. He hugs him again, embraces him again. And again, it's very tough and it's very difficult until he says, until I could barely breathe, and then he lets them go again and asks them a third time, Iqra, and he responds with the same exact thing. Because he's truthful. The point here is, you know how sometimes you do something at home and you get asked the question, who did it? Not me. 
Who did it? Not me. Who did it? I did it. Okay, you just want to get out of it, right? With interrogation, you want to get out of it. He was so truthful that he, he did not change his answer. He didn't tell him, okay, fine, tell me what to read. He says, I don't know how to read. He's not lying. He's not inventing anything. He's telling them exactly who he is, right? That's, again, a sign of his truthfulness and honesty. So nothing had changed in his condition. These events, although it was difficult and it was hard, but it didn't change who he was, right? This is inter interesting, because with interrogation right now, you would be innocent in the beginning. They tell you you did it, you're like, no, I didn't do it. Interrogate you some more, some waterboarding, you know, some nice uh, creative ways of torture, and all of a sudden, you, you write a book on it. You're like, look, what do you want me to say? Read, read the witnesses, the people who came out of these situations. Allah make it easy on people. Read what they say. They said, I told them, just tell me what you want me to say and I'll say it. Just tell me. Give me the script. Right? So then he takes them a third time and then he lets them go. And then he starts reciting the very first passages that we're all familiar with. Iqra' bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min alaq. اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم. So uh, should we pause here for next week and then we'll we'll go through the interpretation of this. I didn't anticipate the intro to be this long, so I do apologize, and I hope you guys weren't bothered by that. But but hopefully we'll cover the the rest of it. But basically the very first part of our book, the Quran, is that Surah Al Alaq, the very first five verses. It's only the first five, by the way. So again, that's something that we're going to learn, is that we have to become more familiar with the Qur'an. The Qur'an was not sent down as a book. By the way, kitab in Arabic does not mean book. This guy is inventing new things right now. It means a book in modern standard Arabic, but kitab in Arabic means any written document. So when you write a letter, it's called a kitab. In Islamic history, when a king would write a, a note, what is it called? Kitab. When the Prophet himself sent letters to different kings, it was called Kitab. Was he sending them books? It was very brief, straight to the point. Kitab means maktub, something that is written, a written document, right? The Quran never came down like this. Did not come down as a book. Something else to appreciate. Right now we have it in our shelves, we have it in our homes, we have it everywhere, right? Some of us have it in our smart devices. Remember that this took time to come down. And that teaches us gradualism. Doing things gradually. Things cannot happen overnight. Yes, you may know something important, but not everyone is on your level, right? You may have figured certain things out, whether it's in your family, in your community, in your neighborhood. Not everybody's on your level. Give people time. That's difficult, right? Parents, all of a sudden, they may come through a, like a, a great, uh, I don't know, euphoria, is that what you call it? Come up with like a great, amazing, Epiphany, yeah, you come up with an epiphany. You expect everybody in the household to have the same idea. The wife and the children, you're like, they don't have your experiences. And you can't force people to have the experiences that you have. You got to let people grow on their own time. So remember, the Quran came, it came, and it wasn't easy when it came. It was difficult on the carrier of the message. And Allah tells them, this is a heavy burden, it's a heavy book. Inna sanulqi alayka qawlan thaqila. We are bringing down onto you a heavy speech. This is not easy. So this is again another challenge. For us, even young people can read the whole Quran, but we don't understand it. But if we were to understand it, we would actually hold back a bit, not rush too much to say things. We would hold our tongues, right? It didn't come down all at once. It came down in a gradual fashion. Throughout the 23 year period of the mission, the ministry of the Prophet, small passages like this would come down. Five verses, ten verses at a time. And then the community would actually accept them, understand them, implement them before they move on to the others. Again, it's a different type of style of learning. So we ask Allah to bless us, to increase us in good, to forgive us for our shortcomings. And we will continue if Allah gives us time next week. So with this, I will conclude with a short prayer so we can break for salah. اللهم إنا نسألك علما نافعا ورزقا طيبا وعملا متقبلا Oh Allah, we ask you for beneficial knowledge for blessed and pure provisions and for accepted righteous actions اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما Help us to benefit from what we learn Teach us beneficial information and increase us in beneficial knowledge 
اللهم اجعل ما تعلمناه حجة لنا لا علينا We ask you to make what we learn an evidence for us and not an evidence against us اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه Show us the truth as truth and guide us to follow it Show us falsehood as falsehood and keep it away from us اللهم أعنا على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن عبادتك We ask you Allah to help us to remember you at all times to be grateful to you for all your blessings and to worship you in the best of ways Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam. We ask you, Allah, to bless the Messenger Muhammad, to honor and compliment him, to protect him, and to shower him with grace and blessings along with his family and his righteous followers until the last day. Allahumma waj'alna min atba'ihi salihin. Make us from his righteous followers, his upright and pious followers, Ya Allah. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Allah is far above any imperfection. Uh, any imperfection. We praise him. We testify that there is nothing worthy of worship besides him. We seek his forgiveness and we repent to him. And I leave you all in the trust of Allah, in the protection of Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh, <laughs> no.